In our text last week, Jesus brought a little girl back from the dead. Today, he brings someone else back to life, this time his friend Lazarus, now four days in his grave. Now, even for Jesus, this is a miraculous feat. But there's a part of me that wonders if he isn't maybe going a little too far this time. It's one thing to cure an illness or to cast out a demon, but returning the dead to life really upends the natural order of things. But Jesus is in mourning, and I suppose he'll do anything to make that feeling go away. But what about the rest of us who can't? Reading this morning from the book of John, chapter 11, 32 through 44. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Here with the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. May they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Nearly a decade ago, 15-year-old Arthur Cave fell 60 feet from the overpass at Ovingdean Gap in East Sussex. He was found there the next morning, mortally wounded, and no one could save him. Arthur's father, the infamous songwriter and composer Nick Cave, frontman of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, had already begun work on his 16th studio album at the time. And remarkably, hauntingly, he had already composed the opening lyrics of that record. You fell from the sky and crash landed in a field near the river Ader. Flowers spring from the ground, lambs burst from the wombs of their mothers in a hole beneath the bridge. That album which he called Skeleton Tree, wasn't finished until a year later. And so the result remains a haunting testimony of one man's mourning in the wake of his son's death. It is a raw lament, a somber expression of choking, suffocating grief. You turn, you kneel, lace up his shoes, your little blue-eyed boy, he sings, his voice nearly breaking. Take him by his hand, go move and spin him down the hall. I knew the world, it would stop spinning now since you've been gone. Much like 
Johnny Cash before him, many of Nick Cave's songs are grim, violence even, despite invocations of religious language. He once wrote an entire album called Murder Ballads, which is exactly what it sounds like. All things move toward their end, he broods on that particular record. All things move toward their end, of that you can be sure. This is all to say that the man is no stranger to suffering. He's a recovering heroin addict, he lost his teenage son, and just last year he lost another, his 31-year-old son, Jethro. Cave is a man with every reason to surrender hope, to abandon joy, a man with every reason to descend ever further into cynicism and despair, a man with every reason to be bitter, and who indeed was rather bitter to begin with. The urge to kill somebody was basically overwhelming, he mumbles in another song on Skeleton Tree. I had such hard blues down there in the supermarket queues. The first time I lost someone, I was really too young to understand the gravity of what had happened. I mean, I knew that my grandfather had passed away. I knew that I would never see him again, but he and I didn't have much of a relationship, really, so I couldn't comprehend the depth of the hurts in my family. He'd been ill, more or less, my entire life, and I can't recall ever seeing him anywhere except in his rocking chair in my grandparents' living room or in his sickbed. I was probably about seven years old when he died, and I'm a little ashamed to recall how excited I was about getting to ride in a limousine on the way to the cemetery. It wasn't until his wife, my nana, left us many years later that I felt the first real pangs of grief. I'd spent my childhood summers at her house across town after my grandfather had passed, and we were close. My brother and I would go swimming in her pool, and she'd bake us brownies, always milling around in the kitchen while we watched cartoons or played on our Nintendo. We actually kept the Nintendo at her house. That's how much time we spent there. Those were truly halcyon days, some of the best and sweetest that I've ever known. I got the call at 3 o'clock in the morning, startled from a dream in which my grandmother had appeared to me. She hadn't said a word, just gave me this knowing smile and turned around and disappeared just before the phone tore me from sleep. I didn't know who was calling, but I already knew what they were going to tell me. I was attending seminary at the time, and in her will, my nana stipulated that I be the one to officiate her memorial service. That was a daunting uh, assignment. It was the first time that I ever officiated a, a service, though there would be dozens more in the years to come. And while it was hard, it was also healing, because I felt like she and I had shared something special one last time, just between us. As a pastor, of course, I would go on to lead many memorial services, and I work with a lot of folks who are in mourning, who are grieving, and generally speaking, I will do whatever I can to help a family through that process. Some churches are very particular about their funerals, only allowing certain kinds of music to be played or certain kinds of readings or very limited number of people to speak on behalf of the deceased. But for my part, if it's helpful to the grieving process, I'll generally let people do whatever they want to do. We'll play old college fight songs from someone's alma mater. We'll share readings from a favorite poem or a song. And we'll give folks the time that they need to tell stories and share their memories. If I know the person well enough, I may even be so bold as to make a joke or two if I think they would have appreciated it. I try to make the service personal. I do whatever I can to honor and celebrate this person and the lives that they touched and the life that they lived. 
But there was one time where I had second thoughts about my participation and about how far I was willing to go. I'd been contacted by a family who lost someone, an older man who had been a lifelong congregationalist but didn't have any church of his own. This is a fairly common occurrence, actually, except that this time the service was being held at a funeral parlor a couple of towns over where the regular staff was on strike. You see, a lot of these family-owned places have been bought up by big corporations uh, where profit motives play a larger role in the business of death, and I guess the people who worked in this place were not too happy with upper management. Now, I found myself in a bit of an ethical dilemma. I'm generally supportive of workers and their right to strike when they feel like they're being taken advantage of or disenfranchised. And yet, for whatever reason, that's where this family wanted to celebrate this man's life. So I was forced to choose between abandoning them in their time of need or essentially becoming a strike breaker. In the end, I crossed the picket line and I officiated the service, though I can't say that I felt great about it. I don't know if that was the right thing to do, but for the sake of the family and their grief, I was willing to suspend my own principles. Makes me wonder just what I'd be willing to do if I could actually bring someone back that I loved, someone that I'd lost just how far I'd be willing to go to make that pain go away. Now, Jesus is no stranger to suffering either. He was homeless, a vagabond that eschewed creature comforts unless he happened to be invited over for dinner. Jesus slept on the ground or in a boat as often as in a bed. And worse still, several people had tried to murder him. King Herod, angry villagers, Pharisees, Sadducees, his best friend, and finally the Romans who crucified him. And yet in the midst of all of this pain and suffering, there was one kind of suffering that it seems like Jesus was unwilling or unable to endure, and that is the anguish that comes with grief. Jesus cannot stand to see people suffer. Left and right, he heals the sick and gives sight to the blind, feeds the hungry and casts out demons. In last week's scripture, he brings a little girl that has just died back to life, pushing the envelope of his powers further than ever before. And today the stakes are even more personal because the man who has died, Lazarus, is Jesus' friend. If you could bring a loved one back from the dead, would you? Should you? Earlier on in this text, we're told that Jesus gets word of Lazarus' illness while preaching in a town two miles away. But he delays going to see him. In fact, Jesus even stays two days longer than he planned to, because in his words... This sickness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of Man might be glorified through it. Put simply, according to the Gospel of John, Jesus lets Lazarus die so that he can bring him back and impress everybody. It doesn't seem quite right. But in some ways, it's typical of the Gospel of John. Here, Jesus always knows exactly what's going on. He is supremely confident in everything he does. He manipulates events to demonstrate God's power. Even as he walks to Golgotha and his own death with a cross on his shoulder, he remains confident that everything is going exactly according to plan. It's a far cry from the Jesus that we find in other Gospels, an embattled, anxious man who struggles to come to terms with his own identity, who begs God to spare him the suffering of the cross. I personally find that image of Jesus more compelling and more likely. Still, 
After we're told that Jesus let Lazarus die so that he could bring him back, we're also told that Jesus wept. When faced with the grief of Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, the grief of those who have gathered at his house to mourn him, when faced with his own grief, Jesus breaks down in tears. Now that part rings true to me. Jesus, while willing to sacrifice his own life, cannot seem to let anyone else suffer or die. He always heals them or he brings them back to life because he can and because it's the compassionate thing to do and because grief, perhaps, is the very worst kind of hurt. It's the kind of hurt that even Jesus, it seems, is not willing to endure. And yet, we must. We live our lives, really, in a persistent state of mourning. We've probably all lost someone close to us, but even if not, we've all lost something. An unfulfilled dream too late to come true. Our innocence. Our childhood. God, I miss those summer days at my Nana's house as much as I miss her. I miss spending time with my father, who's no longer with us, watching stupid sci-fi movies and going to Burger King or the arcade as much as I miss the man himself. I already miss the days when my own kids were younger, and my youngest is still only in second grade. Even as we're born, we cry out, grieving the sanctuary of our mother's womb. As philosopher Emile Sioran writes in his book, The Trouble with Being Born, this very second has vanished forever, lost in the anonymous mass of the irrevocable. It will never return. And I suffer from this. We all have to come to terms, I think, with this fundamental truth, with the reality of entropy. All things move toward their end. Of that you can be sure. And our challenge, I believe, and to be honest, I'm still struggling with it, is to find joy amidst this hurt. Not mere happiness or pleasure or another dopamine hit, but real joy. And I think that joy isn't necessarily about happy endings in the traditional sense. Even Lazarus, who Jesus raises from death, gets killed again by the chief priests who don't want proof of Jesus' power walking around town. Jesus only delays the inevitable here. Lazarus cannot cheat death forever. None of us can. Real joy, though. Real joy is elusive and a bit hard to define. It's like a firefly that lights up the dark. Like a meal delivered in your time of mourning. It's in a hole beneath the bridge where a young man falls to his doom, where flowers spring from the ground and lambs burst forth in the wombs of their mothers. The times that Jesus and Lazarus broke bread together, walked along the, shore, along the shoreline together, laughed and cried together, I think that was it. That was joy and knowing Trusting, believing, believing that our loved ones are in God's hands, living on in a beautiful and mysterious universe that transcends all we know. Well, maybe there's a kind of joy in that, too. As Jesus says to Mary, do you believe this? In the wake of losing his sons, Arthur and Jethro, Nick Cave began an online forum that he calls the Red Hand Files, in which he reflects on existential questions from whoever wants to write in. And in one of these, a, a fan of his accuses Cave of having lost his edge in recent years, of sounding more like a Hallmark card 
in his more recent songwriting, forgoing the menace and sorrow that characterized his earlier work. And I want to conclude this reflection on mourning today with Cave's reply to this, because the man's lost more than I have, for one thing, because I think he says it better than I ever could. Things changed after my first son died, he writes. I changed. For better or for worse, the rage you speak of lost its allure. And yes, perhaps I became a Hallmark card hippie. Hatred stopped being interesting. Those feelings were like old dead skins that I shed. They were their own kind of puke. Sitting around in my own mess, angry at the world, disdainful of the people in it, and thinking my contempt for things somehow amounted to something, had some kind of nobility, hating this thing there, and that thing here, and that thing over there, and making sure that everybody around me knew it. And not just knew, but felt it too. Contemptuous of beauty, contemptuous of joy, contemptuous of happiness in others. Well, this whole attitude just felt... I don't know, in the end, sort of dumb. For me, to strive toward joy has become a calling and a practice, he continues. It is carried out with the full understanding of the terms of this hallowed and harrowed world. I pursue it with an awareness that joy exists both in the worst of the world and within the best, and that joy flighty, jumpy, startling thing that it is, often finds its true voice within its opposite. Joy sings small, bright songs in the dark. These moments, so easily disregarded, so quickly dismissed, are the radiant points of light that pierce the gloom and give validation to the world. That's how the light gets in. Amen.